Kublai says, dude, had a conversation with hyper charismatics for four hours yesterday about deliverance ministries and stuff. Got told if I talked to God more, I would agree with them. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Oh, man. It's so hard when it comes to subjective experience. I do want to talk about this. We're in our men's cohort and we were discussing the topic of charismatic Christianity and speaking in tongues in particular. And we were going back and forth, had a lot of discussion. And somebody said something like, I can't understand how somebody could believe in speaking in tongues is a biblical idea. And here's what I said. I said, hey, I hear what you're saying. And we were going back and forth on some of the verses. But I told them this. This is what I said. And I just want you to think about this. I said, imagine you're praying one day. And you're just praying. And all of a sudden, praying in English, you begin speaking in tongues. In private, in your prayer closet. You're just sitting there. You're praying. You're praying to God. And boom, you start speaking in tongues. In some sort of weird way. Kind of freaks you out a little bit. Right? But then... Once you start looking for a church, you are probably going to look for a church that is embracing and accepting of this particular form of prayer because you have personally experienced it. You know what I mean? So it's really, really hard to argue with experience. It's really, really hard to argue with subjectivity. I had a conversation with one of my Mormon friends and we were sitting there talking about the validity of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and we were going back and forth and how can you trust it and how can you trust the Bible, all that type of stuff. And I kept trying to get him to the point where he would recognize objectively the Book of Mormon is suspect. And he actually granted it at one point. He was like, yeah, I can understand how it'd be suspect. And he said, but I prayed about it and I know it's true. How do you argue with that? That's not even an argument. It's... I, I'm having, I have had an internal impression or experience that such and such is the case, that this must be true, that this must be the way it is. Okay. You, you can't argue with that, right? Here's what I always try to tell people in this situation. And for me, it's the clincher. The Bible does not teach that Everything that goes on in the spiritual world or the spiritual realm is good or even neutral. The Bible teaches that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, for me, that means you can have a subjective experience that's wrong. You can have a subjective experience or opinion or idea or assurance or something. That is actually not true. That's not biblical. That's not in line with God. And it ne won't necessarily feel demonic. It won't necessarily feel as though this is a lie. It will feel like this is right. This is correct. And yet, it could be a deception. Because of the inherent error that is built into subjectivity... I think we then have to say the tiebreaker. You have a subjective experience that says such and such is the case. I have a subjective experience that says the opposite of the, is the case. I'm not denying your subjective experience and you're not denying mine. The problem is we have no metric by which to discern which experience is right and which one is wrong. So the tiebreaker between subjective experiences is the objective word of God. We must be able to go to the word of God and discern truth from there. I'm not denying the subjective. That's good that you've had a subjective experience. That's good that you believe in prayer, that God told you this or whatever. I'm not denying any of that. But in order to be sure that what you've heard is truth from God, it must line up with his word. And to me, that's the tiebreaker. And that's the important part. Okay. Now, oftentimes this is used as a sort of cudgel to basically say your subjective experience doesn't matter. And I really want my charismatic brothers and sisters to hear that's not what I'm saying. I actually think subjective experience is really important and powerful. But in order to discern it properly, you can't trust your gut. You can't go with your feelings. You have to go with the word of God. That's how I feel, at least. That's how I feel. Exactly. Gilbert says, it really stinks when people believe so strongly that their way is the right way. And if you believe differently, then you're wrong and you're even going to hell. I agree 100%, Gilbert. In fact, if you look at my video I did on... 
I think it's three problems I have with fundamentalists. I, I talk about that because that that's something that's really near and dear to my heart. I am a biblicist. I love the Bible. I love the word of God. I love all of those things. But for me, it's not, for me, it's not as though I adhere to it in a single closed-minded fashion because I recognize that my interpretation of the text might be suspect. And so I'm willing to hear out what others have to say, even if I disagree with them. And I've learned a lot oftentimes from others that I disagree with because they help me to see the text in a new way. Even if I didn't agree with their conclusions, oftentimes I will learn a lot just through interacting with them and engaging them. Psalm 22, what can only God do versus what angels and demons can do? Like the gifts and knowing our thoughts. Yeah, it's a good point, Psalm 22. I just finished reading not all of Exodus, but the part of Exodus when they're in Egypt. And you guys will recall that all of the miracles that Moses could do, not all of them, but almost all of them, the magicians could do. So he would turn his staff into a snake, and so would they, right? And then because of that, Pharaoh wouldn't believe. They they would multiply frogs, and the magicians multiplied frogs. They could turn water into blood, and the magicians turned water into blood. They couldn't multiply gnats. That's weird. I wonder what that means. They couldn't multiply gnats. They could do everything else, but they couldn't multiply gnats. That's odd. But that's a perfect example of you can't always just trust, oh, this was miraculous, right? And in fact, some premillennial interpretations of Revelation point out the fact that the Antichrist is going to be able to do or perform miracles. So that's not the only judgment. You also have to go off the judgment of the gospel and the quality and character of the individual. Whenever I run across anything that's influenced by Satan, it's almost always telling you to trust yourself, to be the best you, to become a more exalted human being, to lean into your free will, because you are going to rise to a higher status. God's trying to hold you back, or this religion is trying to hold you back. You can be so much more. Whenever I see that message associated with ideas that are vaguely spiritual, I begin to get a little bit skeptical. In contrast, Jesus' message is, if you want to find your life, you need to lose it. It's a message of sacrifice. It's a counterintuitive or paradoxical message of, in order to gain your life, you must lose it. In order to follow me, you must sacrifice. If you want to gain the world, you will sacrifice your life. Whoever's greatest among you must become the least. This is the message of Jesus. It's counterintuitive. So to become the best you, according to Jesus, you need to die to self. The old man needs to be buried and the new man needs to be raised to newness of life. Satan's message never is like that. Satan's message is almost always... God, religion, XYZ is trying to hold you back from being the best possible you. You need to break the bonds of tyranny and become the best you possible. That That's often, as far as I'm concerned, that's often how Satan presents his message. So that's something I always keep in the back of my mind. I'm not saying it's definitive, Psalm 22, but it is something I keep in the back of my mind.